Russell, and welcome to B4, which is the fourth part of the recognition of pest and pest damage. Uh, and to start off, we are going to start off talking about nuisance flies. Okay, before we start talking about flies, let's take a look at the fly life cycle real quick. This is the life cycle of a fly. As you can see, it begins in the adult stage with an adult laying eggs. Then the eggs grow into the first stage known as the larva. Then they go to the pupa and then the adult stages. As adults, flies have one pair of visible wings and the larvae are called maggots. They have no legs and the head is actually at the small pointed end of the body. Okay, now let's take a look at the house fly. The house fly is distributed worldwide. It has long been a transmitter of filth and disease. They land on and frequently eat almost any kind of filth and they may visit home food, shedding bacteria and other pathogens as they move. Because of its sponging mouth parts, the housefly can take only liquid food. Thus, to eat solid food, it must dissolve them either in saliva or regurgitated stomach contents. Flies are a nuisance in homes, commercial establishments, dairies, horse stables, and other areas, particularly where the conditions are unsanitary. Adult house flies are dull gray with four stripes on the thorax. They are about a quarter of an inch long, although they may be found throughout the year, they are most abundant in the spring and the summer. The life cycle is one to six weeks depending on developmental conditions. Larvae develop in animal waste or rotting food, fruits and vegetables. Several other fly species occur in and around human habitations and are a particular nuisance. One of those is the blue blowfly. The blue blowfly can be commonly found on dying and decaying flesh of a dead animal or in garbage. All right, here's a photo of a green blowfly. So both the green blowfly and the blue blowfly will um, come from either garbage or dying and decaying flesh. Now it's very important that you can identify these two flies correctly because if you have a customer there that tells you that they're seeing flies in their house, you need to be able to look at them and be able to tell if they're house flies or if it's a blowfly, because if it's a blowfly, then you know specifically that these are coming from dying and decaying flesh. That's what they're, they feed on. Uh, so that'll give you a, <clears throat> a good idea that maybe they have a dead rat, or they might have uh, some uh, meat or something that was in the trash that's rotting, and, there's, and that's a good chance of where those, this type, particular type of fly might be coming from. Okay, here is a copy of my business card. So take a look at this business card and tell me what kind of a fly is this I have on my card. Yep, that's right. It's a blue blowfly. Okay, now let's take a look at a stable fly. Stable fly is commonly found around decaying vegetation like lawn clippings and animal feces. 
just like <clears throat> its name says, the stable fly is very commonly found in horse stables because of the manure that's in those horse stables. Okay, now let's take a look at the fruit fly. Take a good look at this because if you're in a house and they're telling you they have flies in their house and you're looking for it and you're trying to decide if it's a house fly or maybe it's a blow fly, it's coming from flesh. Uh, if you see a fly like this with red eyes on it, there's a good chance that this is a fruit fly. Now the fruit flies, just like their names say, are going to come from overly ripe fruit or vegetables. <clears throat> and typically that's uh, because they have made a meal and they got some fruit and vegetables either going bad somewhere or they've made a meal and they've thrown this stuff in the trash can that's been sitting in the trash for a while and that will create fruit flies. So if you see these, um, the best way to get rid of these fruit flies, the easiest way, is to simply remove the source that they're coming from. So if you can figure out that they're coming from, say, some um, fruit that was in the trash and they get rid of that trash, their problem is probably that simply easily solved just by getting rid of that trash. Okay, now we're going to look at what's called the ferret fly. It's also known as humpback flies. These guys feed on decaying organic material in drains, garbage cans, or disposals, or under appliances. Okay, next is the fungus gnat. The fungus gnat feeds on dying and decaying organic matter and potted plants. Now these are little tiny gnats that when people will say that they're seeing something flying in the house, sometimes they'll say little flies or little bugs, but if it's a little gnat, then there's a good chance that it's the fungus gnat. And these guys will, uh, it's very common that if they have a plant in their house or a lot of times even in offices, we'll see a plant that's being overwatered and that'll have the fungus gnats in them. Um, also, <clears throat> if they're coming out of, of the drains or something like that, some, you can pour some bleach down the drains and that will help. But mainly, if they will stop overwatering those plants, that will usually take care of the problem of the fungus gnats. Okay, now let's take a look at drain flies. Drain flies are also called moth flies because when you look at them real close, they look like little moths. Uh, they feed on dying and decaying organic matter and they're commonly found down in the drains. These are little tiny flies and it, when, there again, when you have people tell you that they're seeing little gnats, it's probably either a fungus gnat or one of these drain flies. And you can see in this photo here, this little fly on the end of a finger that they're they're real tiny and they can sometimes be hard to see. So if you have a house that has drain flies, um, there again, if they will pour some bleach down those drains and clean those out, that will usually take care of the problem. Okay, now let's talk about moths. Moths are important pests of stored food and fibers. The larvae eat large amounts of food but are even more of a problem because they contaminate the food so that it cannot be sold for human consumption. Some species web their food with so much silk that it clogs mill machinery. Excessive populations may lead to microorganism problems. Okay, now we're going to take a look at some of the more common and important moths. And the first one that we're going to look at is called the Angomius grain moth. Now, the adults have four wings with about a half inch wing spread. The four wings are a pale yellow. The hind wings are gray and pointed, resembling a pointing finger. The larvae attack whole grain and feed inside the grain. On emergence, they leave a round flap over the hole in the grain. 
These moths are very common in the southern U.S. They usually attack in the field first and continue generation after generation in stored grain. They are usually six or seven generations per year. In heated warehouses, there may be as many as 12 generations. The pupa are often found inside grain. So I'm often asked, where do these things come from? Well, as you've just seen, they usually, it starts out in the field, in the farmer's field, they get in the grain, then it's harvested, it's taken to these warehouses, and then it gets packaged, and when they buy um, some grain product at the store and they bring it home, they bring it into their house. So it wasn't anything they did wrong, it was actually in the product for, at the mill. All right, now let's take a look at the Indian meal moth. Adults have four wings with about a three-quarter inch wingspan. The four wings are gray near the body and reddish near the tip. The head and the thorax are reddish. The larvae feed on the surface of grains and spin large amounts of silk webbing in and over their food. There are five or six generations per year. Although Indian meal moth larvae prefer flour, they also feed on many raw products and packaged dry foods, including dried fruit, seeds, powdered milk, chocolate, candies, and other foods. So the Indian meal moth is a very common moth that I see in a lot of houses. And people, there again, they just don't understand how they get these. Well, it's the same thing. They get into the grain, usually out in the field or in the mill, and they go um, into the food products. It gets packaged and then to the store, and then the people buy this stuff at the store, and they bring it home, and they put it in their pantry. Now, as they start to hatch out, these guys will get into other food that's in the pantry as well and start to contaminate that food. So it's very important to be able to identify the Indian meal moth. And we can use some pesticides and we can use glue traps and some pheromone traps. And there's things to try to help to control these things. <clears throat> but really, the best way to control the Indian meal moth is to eliminate the source. That means the customer needs to go through their pantry and look through... Um, it, everything, it, it, everything that can be grain related or any of these products that, that they can eat on it, um, they could be in. And you can't always see them. They, they might be in it now and you just don't see it because they haven't emerged out yet. So it's important that they um, package all of their products, either in baggies or uh, Tupperware or jars, and then keep an eye on it, and as they see anything emerging out, that they completely get rid of those products. Also, packaging these things will help to um, it'll help to eliminate the, the spreading uh, and, and stop the life cycle to get rid of them. And so, there once again, really the only way to deal with these these moths um, is to eliminate the source. Okay, now we're going to talk about the Mediterranean flower moth. Adults have four pale gray wings with a wing spread of about three quarters of an inch. The front wings have wavy lines. The adults rest with the head and thorax held high. The larvae feed on the surface of their food and spin large amounts of silk in and over it. On each abdominal segment they have lateral dark spots which distinguish this species from the Indian meal moth. Although these insects prefer flour, they also infest wheat, brine, nuts, chocolate, seeds, 
biscuits, dried beans, and dried fruits. The Almond Moth The almond moth adults resemble the Mediterranean flower moth. The forewings are molted gray, but on some individuals <clears throat> they are suffused strongly with fawn-colored scales. The entire life cycle requires five to six weeks. When almond moths fly, they dart quickly about and their wings vibrate rapidly. They scatter their eggs over the surface of the host food. The larvae, which is about half an inch long when full grown, are white with four rows of purple spots on their backs. They feed on cereals, cocoa, cocoa beans rather, dried fruit, grain, peanuts, and shelled nuts. Okay, let's talk about beetles for a little bit. Beetles are an important pest of stored foods. Both the larval and the adult can cause economic damage. Under ideal conditions, they have six or more generations per year and quickly become a serious problem. Let's take a look at a couple of beetles. The first one that you're looking at right here is called the rice weevil. <clears throat> so let's talk about the rice weevil and the granary weevil, which are two very similar beetles. Now the rice weevil and the granary weevil are about an eighth of an inch long and they're dark brown. Their mouth, uh, their mouth parts drawn into an elongated snout. The larvae are small, white, legless grubs and they feed and develop inside individual kernels of grain. These weevils attack grain before harvest and storage as well as grain products that are cracked or modified into hard items such as spaghetti. Rice weevils can fly and as if you look at this photo real closely you can see that they have two pale spots on each wing cover. The granary weevil cannot fly and it has two pale spots on its wing covers. The confused flower beetle and the red flower beetles are elongated, flat, shiny, reddish brown and about an eighth of an inch long. The adults and larvae are serious pests of flower mills feeding on cereal grains and dried foods, including flour, cereal, nuts, and spices. The red flower beetles are strong flyers. However, the confused flower beetles cannot fly. Okay, now let's talk about spiders. Spiders are arachnoids, not insects. Insects are going to have three body regions <clears throat> and they're going to have six legs. Um, arachnoids do not. They have two body regions and eight legs. Uh, spiders are arachnoids. They have eight legs and no wings. Spiders generally are docile animals that feed primarily on insects and other small related animals. They are commonly found in dimly lit, cool places that are seldom disturbed by people. Most spider bites occur when people are cleaning or playing in a basement, garages, 
barns, or similar areas. When disturbed or greatly intimidated, spiders bite their victims with howl fangs that can hold the victim and inject fluid from the modified saliva glands. In the United States, the black widow, the brown widow, and the brown recluse spiders have the most dangerous bite. Venom from the black widow may cause hypertension, muscle spasms, weakness, and paralysis. Venom from the brown recluse spiders cause local ulcerations. All right, so what you're looking at right here is a black widow spider. And you're actually looking at the underside of it. Uh, if you were looking at it from the top, you would not be seeing this red hourglass um, figure that, that's so you know, uh, easily related to for the Black Widow. Uh, so when they <clears throat> hang on their web, they usually will turn around backwards uh, so that you can see that red mark on them. Okay, so something else about the Black Widow spider that will help you to identify them when you find them is I really commonly see them in garages down in the corners on each side of the garage door, on the big door, when you open and close that big door, on this, on, down in the corners you'll see this messy looking spider web. Now the spider web for uh, most spiders that, that you think of being in a, a nice round pattern and has a, a nice distinctive look to it, that is not what the uh, Black Widow does. Their spiders are webs are very messy looking and they'll have um, some little almost look like little cotton balls that'll be in there and, and those are the egg sacs that are inside of it so if you come across a messy looking um, spider web and especially in a garage in a kind of a dark <clears throat> I, I mentioned these corners in these garages because they're they're typically undisturbed in those corners and that's what they look for uh, if you see that uh, be careful because these are venomous spiders. They're not just poisonous. Uh, these are actually, they actually have a venom like snakes do and they can do a lot of damage and can even be deadly. So watch out for the black widow. Uh, the black widow, only the female, is the one that you really have to worry about. They're the only ones that are poisonous. Um, they get their name because they kill the male uh, spider after uh, they have babies and so that's where it gets its name the black widow okay now let's take a look at the brown widow spider this is the brown widow spider and kind of similar to the black widow but just a different color you can tell that it's got the same kind of long legs and the same type of body of course, it's an arachnoid, so it's going to have two body regions and eight legs. Um, and so you may be asking yourself, well, <clears throat> does the brown widow spider have a, <clears throat> a, uh, a hourglass <clears throat> on its abdomen underneath on the belly side like the black widow spider does? And let's take a look at this photo, and it'll, that'll answer that question for you. And here's a photo where you can see the underside of the abdomen on the brown recluse. And I think that that answers the question. Yes, you can definitely see the red hourglass shape. Uh, or I'm sorry, I said brown recluse. And I meant to say brown widow. Um, so both the brown widow and the brown recluse are both venomous spiders. However, they do look quite a bit different. So you have your black widow, which is easily, uh, you know, you can tell that apart really di uh, easily, the black widow from the brown recluse. However, the black widow and the brown widow look very similar. They're just different colors. 
But <clears throat> now let's take a look at what the uh, the brown recluse looks like. And here, this is the brown recluse. Now the brown recluse, as you can see, has these long legs and <clears throat> it, the body on it is kind of smooth, kind of like a black widow, but it's got a different look to it. It's not as rounded off. The head is a little bit bigger or maybe the same size as the abdomen on the black widow. It's got a small head and a big round abdomen. So it's got a little bit different look to it. However, the legs on this are kind of similar to the black widow. But I will say this, the brown recluse is, uh, it, it's not as big of a spider as it looks here. It's actually kind of a small spider and not much different in size from the black widow. But it, uh, if you look on its back and you look right above its head, you can see that brown spot with a, long, with a line on it. That's what they call the violin shape that you can identify a brown recluse with. So this is what the brown recluse looks like. Okay, now this is a wolf spider. And a lot of people will see this and think that it's a brown recluse, but it's not. It's a very common spider. You see it outside running around in the grass a lot. You'll never see a brown recluse doing that. This wolf spider, they can bite you. Um, but I've never heard of anybody being bit by one. <clears throat> they're uh, very afraid of you. If they see you, they're going to run away. They're not in, uh, inclined to attack you in any way. Uh, but th they're, they're kind of hairy, and they can get really big, and it almost looks like a tarantula. So that's a wolf spider. So when you see those, those are definitely not the brown recluse. And the way that you can positively identify that it's not being a brown recluse is it does not have that violin shape above its head. And then again, here is the brown recluse. As you can see, they look quite a bit different if you really know what you're looking for. The brown recluse doesn't have the hair on it. The, the legs are not as thick. Um, this is going to be, a just like its name says, a very reclusive spider. It's almost actually hard to find this spider. Um, I very rarely see them unless you're looking uh, under something, like you may pick up a coffee cup that's been sitting up in an attic, and, and you can look inside of it, and, and there might be a little kind of messy web, just like the Black Widow. These guys make little messy webs, too. And if you see that, um, that's a good sign. You better watch out. It's probably, it could be a Black Widow or a Brown Recluse. And this guy has a really bad bite. I would have to say it's probably even worse than the Black Widow or the Brown Widow. Uh, they can be really bad. I've seen photos of where people have been bitten on the fingers, and it's gotten so bad that the finger had to be amputated. Of course, it can even affect you uh, bad enough that, you, that it could even kill you. So this is a very dangerous spider. It hides out. It likes to be in undisturbed places. So... Uh, be very careful when you're in attics uh, or you're in garages or in storage sheds in those kind of places. Uh, that's where this spider likes to hang out. And uh, if you see it, um, you know, don't mess with it. Uh, so any, any good pesticide will take care of this spider. Uh, and be careful and watch out for the brown recluse. Uh, also, remember... The way that you positively identify this is by the violin shape on its head.